All right, welcome back to Owner Occupied. I'm so excited today to be on with Michael Girdley. Uh, Michael and I have known each other for a couple years now, mostly through Twitter. We met at a conference uh, briefly, and he's got a lot going on. So Michael owns a, a holding company or a hold co, as the cool kids call it these days. And those are in vogue right now. Um, and he can probably share a little bit about why that's good or bad, actually, because there's always a, a flip side to everything. Uh, Michael, I'd love if, for those who aren't familiar, if you wouldn't mind just giving like a 90 second background to kind of bring the audience up to speed on what you've been up to and, and what you're doing now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, thanks again for having me. Um, yeah, my career journey, like I started as like a computer programmer, decided I didn't like computers as much as I like people and ended up in marketing. Um, and I did that all kind of in the Bay Area. Moved back to San Antonio, where I live now, back in 2003, and I got into entrepreneurship the old-fashioned way. I joined a family business, <laughs> uh, and that was a great experience. I was CEO of that company, and then, you know, about a decade ago, started doing what I do now, which is spend a lot more time working on businesses than in them. If I do things right, I don't actually have a CEO job. Um, and you know, I think the, a nutshell of what I do today, um, is having a holding company. Uh, there's about a dozen businesses, um, that I have significant stakes in. Um, and I spend my time as a board chair and coach and supporter of those businesses and the CEOs that run them. So, um, all, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat unique in that I have a very diversified set of stuff, everything from a fireworks company to a training school, to a software business. Um, and each one is really, you know, an atomic unit that, you know, I help supervise and spend my time working on those businesses rather than, than in them. Um, and so, yeah, and I have a ton of fun and I got a bunch of hobbies and a good life and I'm very thankful for being very fortunate. Perfect. I, I love it. And for those who, who aren't already following you on Twitter, uh, Michael's a great follow. He shares a ton. Um, in fact, some of the way that I interact on Twitter is actually modeled off of how you share a lot of the, your playbooks and your your ways of thinking, and you go into detail with these awesome threads. So huge value add there, and just thank you for adding to the community of small business folks on Twitter. You know, real estate Twitter's got their whole thing going on, and then I actually really like the small business side. Property management straddles, right? So we're kind of got a foot in both of those worlds, which I like too. But um, so. The the holding company, so you got you said almost a dozen businesses or about a dozen businesses. And I just want to paint a picture for the audience. Like these are some of these are big businesses. I think you're on the record as saying over a hundred million in annual revenue across the whole portfolio. So one of the things that I'm really interested in these days is like evaluating opportunities. What should I be doing with my time? What's worth getting involved in? And I think as a property management company owner, we see a lot of opportunities because property management sits at the intersection of a lot of different things. You can do brokerage, you can start a maintenance company, you can grow your management company really big. You can, you know, I played around with doing like a window restoration business because um, a lot of things are coming across your plate. You could grow a big real estate uh, private equity business. So as, as you, you've obviously gotten quite clear headed, I think, about what's worth messing with and what's what's a great opportunity versus not a great opportunity. I'd love to hear you maybe riff a little bit about some of the frameworks you use there. Yeah, I think the the there's a couple ideas that I like around this. Um, one is I think that being middle-aged is really good. I like, I, I, there's a lot to be great. I'm almost 50 because you're still at that age for me where like, I feel like I have a ton of energy. You still feel like you, you're mostly like you're 35, but even though you can see the cracks happening, mm -hmm. but you've added another 20 years or 15 years of experience to start to know more about yourself. So for example, like I go to cocktail parties, I hate them. I don't like them, but I go. Right. And like, I've figured out some techniques to deal with them, but like, people are like, come to this cocktail party. I'm like, uh, no, not interested. Like, <laughs> I don't like, I don't like unstructured social situations. I love structured social situations, but I hate unstructured. So that's a big benefit of all this. And so, but to get to that point, I think one of the lenses I like to use to think about opportunities is like to be prolific, like try a bunch of stuff and go, you know, use that as the fastest way to learn what's going to truly make you happy, which I think is the overarching lens of how I encourage people to think about, okay, what should I work on is like, don't think about like what other people want you to do. I mean, we, we all hear that. Don't think about potentially what's going to make you the most money. Uh, don't think about potentially like what, you know, your parents want you to do or any of that kind of stuff. Like, 
instead like uh or don't use a framework to be like okay here's a two by two matrix for where you know bcg would say i should do that i would actually invert it and it's kind of akin to and i don't know if you've heard this have you heard this idea that um the rubric you should always just make a choice for whatever will create the the most entertainment like no. on social media mm -mm. <laughs> it's it's a really it's eline talks about it um and it's basically this idea that uh when uh, if you if you can't make a hard decision just choose whatever path will be like uh the the give you the most interesting content like the most entertaining media. yeah <laughs> yeah the most entertaining one I like and, that. and i think that when I, when I pondered on that and where I've ended up is like, I encourage people to do what I do, which is, you know, if you're going to continue consider making a decision on something, do whatever's going to give you the most joy mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. Because I fundamentally think that's how you maximize life happiness is not like coming up with a Christopher Columbus, Hey, we're going to go from Portugal and hopefully the United States is over there and we're going to discover Cuba. No, it's the other way around, which is like, fundamentally, how do I build my day-to-day? -day? So every one of those minutes maximally has an opportunity to be something that's going to give me the most joy and then go figure out, okay, how can I make money from that? How can I make that sustainable? How can I fix all of that? You know, and for me, as I look at what I enjoy, like I enjoy coaching, I enjoy helping develop and creating opportunities for other people. And like, if I optimize for those types of activities and those types of business ventures, like I get a ton of joy out of those. And so anyway, that's a backwards way of thinking, it, but I think it's foolproof because you can go and say okay well here's how i'm going to spend every single minute and if you know i'm going to spend every single minute doing things that i maximally find joy in then like pretty good chance i'm going to really enjoy my life whereas if you like do this like bcg framework thing or like porter's five forces on opportunities like that's maybe not going to make you happy but i know if you go from the bottom up it is got a really good chance of making you happy yeah i love that um i wrote a blog a while ago about like how to work on your business, not in your business. One of the things I said in there is that procrastination is a signal. So like if you're if you're constantly putting something off, that probably means you just shouldn't do it. It's either not in your area of expertise or it's it's taking you down a path that's not bringing you joy or, or whatever. And that re it reminded me what you were saying. Um, it's like it should feel good. Like and I've got a couple irons in the fire right now. And I'm, I'm I, it's interesting to observe like the opportunities and what they feel like when you start. Um, I, I've noticed that the ones that seem to have legs, like what's that thing about like how something starts is how it is or whatever. Like they're, they're high velocity. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of excitement. I'm like working on it in my spare time and, and it's not like a chore. Yeah. And I, I, I tweet that a lot and nobody likes the tweet, but it's like, look, here's the reality. Like stuff that finishes great starts great. And like it, like that's, I think what you're talking about, like, I love that principle. And like, you know, I talked to my CEO group yesterday and they were like, asked me, we had to present who we are and all that kind of stuff. Cause we rotate as members. So I'm in Vistage and that, yesterday was my day. And they asked me like, what, what are my biggest regrets? And I look at all my biggest regrets and they're actually regrets of inaction, not regrets of action. It's like, I didn't do things sooner. I didn't do things faster um or i didn't i didn't make a decision and take that leap into doing stuff those are all that's the theme of all my regret, regrets and so i think that you know that ties back to what we're we're talking about here in terms of like um you know how do you how do you make those decisions and like like anyway i i, yeah, I yeah. also ramble so sorry <laughs> no I got, I got you yeah so i can't move on from the hold co without asking a question that i know everyone is wondering about which is a dozen companies how do you spend your time? Like, you know, and I know a little bit, I've, I've listened, you know, to you on some other shows and you've gone into some detail here. And I think I understand this framework, but I think for a lot of folks who are in the trenches of running a small business, it's like literally unfathomable that you could have 12 operating companies where you don't have any day-to-day -day responsibilities. So I'm interested to hear like, what was the transition like when you first moved from an operator to a true, um, almost like a board member role, um, how did, like what, what had to be true about your mindset in order to enable this to happen? Yeah. So, I mean, in, to ask, answer the first part of your question, like I don't actually operate anything. Um, like my job is to be a board chairman um, or to be a board member, right? And that is a very different role than an operating CEO. You know, and and like at a, at a core of it, uh, if if somebody who's an operating CEO running one of the businesses has a problem, they come to me with a problem. It's different than your scenario when you're owning an operating business, right? You like 
somebody comes to you and, hey, we have this problem. What do you have to do? You have to go fix it. My job as board chairman is to be like, well, that sounds terrible. What are you going to do about it? You know, and like, and make sure I do my job there. And so, you know, if I look at what my typical week looks like, I actually broke this down yesterday at, at my Vistage group. And I talked about like, okay, well, I spent eight hours a week doing coaching and mentoring and spending time with CEOs, like in one-on-ones and helping them be their best selves. Um, and I'm not, I'm not managing them as much as it's like, that's like a coaching type type situation. Um, and then there's another kind of six to eight hours a week that's spent in the cadence of normal supervision of a business. So board meetings, interim calls, um, all those kind of things that happen there. And then the rest of the week, I'm spending like writing Twitter threads and creating and trying to sharpen the saw and, and get better. Um, spending time on, you know, the media efforts that I'm doing now and getting more and more serious about it. Um, and so, but that's basically how all that works. Uh, if, and if, if I end up going in and doing the job of the CEO, that means something's fundamentally broken. I need to restructure things, but that doesn't mean that I don't spend usually about a day a week on what I call special projects. Like a CEO quits, we need to hire a new one that hasn't happened in four years. So that's a good thing. Um, you know, we did just did some M&A to sell a business. So that was like a special project working on that business. So I will do stuff like that. Banking choices, fundraising, like I'll get involved in that kind of stuff. And that's about another eight to 10 hours a week um, of how I spend my time. You definitely spend a few hours a week recording podcasts. I think you've got several. Um, do you like is is so do you think of the like your Twitter, your newsletter, your podcast? Is that like an operating bit like a media business? Do you think of that as one of your companies or is that just kind of stuff you do? Um, so we have, uh, so last year I had, let me back all this up last year. I had an insight about, um, about media in general, right? Like there's an opportunity to get revenue there. Um, I want to do social media cause I like to help people. And it's also an opportunity that having an audience helps make things easier in my business world. Right? Like, um, we started scale path this year, um, which is basically like a vistage, but for companies that aren't ready for vistage yet. And like, or YPO or E or something like that. And like, um, I, we could only do that cause I have an audience, like it wouldn't have worked otherwise to get that off the ground. So, um, so the audience is very helpful, but it doesn't really, it's not going to move the needle financially. I just want it to break even. Um, and then the second insight I had is like, I really like the creating and teaching part of stuff. I hate like the whole business part of media, like selling ads, like it's, it's poke me in the eye. Like, I just don't want to do that. Uh, the, the numbers are relatively small. It's a hassle. It makes me feel yucky. Like, I don't want to do that kind of stuff. And I don't like di distribution either. So like, I don't want to be like, you know, reposting threads and stuff like that, which we have to do, you know, as a content creator. So anyway, bring all that forward. I also built a course. I got paid for that. I hated the business side of the course. I loved creating the course and the teaching part, like all that's super fun. So this year I've taken kind of this ad hoc stuff. I hired a CEO um, who has already started working and comes full time in July. He'll own that whole media stuff. So like the, my newsletter business, uh, my course business, which, you know, it is what it is. Um, and then like my content production, like owning the funnel, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm getting paid to do speaking gigs, which is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I was like, yay. Like, um, <laughs> so all that kind of stuff. And then I have some consulting gigs too, whatever, like that all lives underneath the CEO who will have a P and L and he'll like do all that part that I don't like, which is, I just want to teach and I want to create, and then he can own all that stuff. So that's, you know, that is Girdly Media. I haven't come up with a better name, but it is basically me and also the podcast business too. So like we run Acquisitions Anonymous, which is my only surviving podcast currently. Yeah, I've started I've started five podcasts. I've killed four of them. Oh, <laughs> so, interesting. Okay. I didn't realize that some of those had stopped. Well, yeah, that's maybe why they did it's a sign they weren't working. <laughs> <laughs> Acquisitions Anonymous is great. Um, I was on the show talking about a property management deal or two that uh, way in the early days, like it was probably one of your first 15 episodes or so. Um, but yeah, that's really taken off and it's a fun listen. I love what you guys have done. Uh, you pivoted a little bit and it's got a, more of a laid back vibe and a lot of jokes and um, it's really fun. It's like one of those podcasts that like I, I always look forward to listening to. Oh, thank you. Well, I think the big, the big, and if you're going to start a podcast, this is something I learned way too way too late. Like for sure you need to be in like a green space where other people aren't. I think you are with this podcast, you know, for your audience, uh, maybe not today's episode, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but like you want to be in green space. And then the second thing that's like super important and what 
changed Acquisitions Anonymous was us having the mindset that Number one, people want to be entertained in a podcast. And number two, they want to be educated. And if they have to pick one, they just want to be entertained. And if you want to get people to open up your podcast, it has to be entertaining. And that's where we really shifted. Like we would bring in like these like folks that were really experts in their thing. (coughs) Excuse me. Um, Johnny will edit that out for me coughing everywhere. Um, But we bring in experts and like you were a great guest, but there were other people that weren't very entertaining guests. And like, yeah, you might learn something about like, you know, small scale SaaS, but it would you wouldn't leave being like, you know what? That was really fun. (laughs) Yeah, let me share this with somebody. Yeah, (laughs) we switched that mindset last August and like the podcast went from like hovering, you know, 90, 100 rating and entrepreneurship. And then a couple of weeks ago, we hit 18 overall, Super. Um, which the charts are what the charts are. But like. Still, like that's up there with like founders. Like my first million yeah. was fifteen that week. Like I was like, oh, like yeah, yeah this is cool. Um, so I want to I want to grab a question from Twitter. Um, ben H Allen the third asks, "What were the early actions you took that shaped where you landed later?" And I'm interested in this too because I think a lot of people listening are like, "This sounds like the dream, right?" And this is like. What everyone wants to do is just sit at the top of this huge hold co and I don't have any operating responsibilities. I've got these great CEOs who never leave and like all this cash rolls up to me and I get to be a, you know, a real deal capital allocator, right? So there must have been, you know, from from your software to your uh, marketing to the fireworks business, there was a path. Like, what do you credit with getting you going in the right direction here? I think, um, and this is not changeable for most people. Like I was really fortunate in life. Like my parents were loving great parents. Like when I was 12, they moved us to the best school district in town, which I live in now. So, cause I want to do the same thing for my kids. Like I graduated college with no debt. Like now was, of course it was 1997. It was kind of a different world there, but like that was all of that was like a great gift that, you know, I looked at my friends who left college and some of them had to go take take high paying jobs because they knew they had to start paying um, college payments. Uh, And I was somebody like they asked me, like we had this like computer science luncheon, like the last last month for all the graduates and were like 15 of us. And they went around the room and they're like, okay, what are you going to do? And I was like, they're all like, I'm going to work at Accenture. I'm going to work at this engineering firm. And I was like, I think I'm going to go drive across America. Like, like, just like, I, I don't know. You know, I was like, I don't know what all these other people are doing, but I know that sucks. Yeah. Um, and so that's something, look, I, I just have to be thankful. And, and to some extent, what drives me to do a lot of teaching and giving is like an acceptance and an appreciation for what the, what I was fortunate to live, be born in the state of Texas in America to great parents, uh, as a man, like there's just a lot of unfair things that were given to me and I need to give back around that kind of stuff. So, but secondarily, like. Like I can remember being ever since my early twenties, that kid that me and my friends would go to the beach and I would have a book like, and it's also cause I'm introverted and odd, but like, like, but at the same time, it's just like, if you think about the theme there that, uh, that I think successful people have, like they are curious people, they are always learning. They are tr- always trying to develop. And like, I can remember, you know, reading, uh, you know, Alfred Sloan's book, right. About general mourners and all this kind of stuff early on, um, to really just try to grow and get more wisdom as quickly as I can. And back then you would go to Barnes and Noble and hope wisdom would come to you. Now you can just go out on the internet and like people are giving it away for free. It's so much easier than it used to be 30 years ago. Um, but yeah, I think that's the, the thing, like you just got to just be studying, learning, growing, you know, make that investment in yourself and it compounds, right? It's the Charlie Munger idea of that kind of stuff. And that's, that's the number one thing I would encourage people really to be doing. Um, and there's a lot of other decisions. I'm happy to dig into any of them, but like, that's one I would be like, look, kids, anybody read a lot, study a lot, be curious. Do you still read a lot of books? Books have slowed down. I just spent about a year and a half not reading many books. And then I got new glasses and now I've started reading books again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how I read books has really changed because I've read all the all the greats, right? Like I'm not going to read 
you know, Robert Kiyosaki's book and get some insight into the power of own, being capital versus labor, right? Like, um, so like I will read books much more in a um, investigative fashion, like skimming stuff where I'm like, yep, I know this already. And now really my hope is to get through a book and maybe have one or two ideas that come out or one or two ways my mind changes and go from there. So are there any that you return to consistently and like reread? Uh, I've read Dune three times. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of business insights in there. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of good business insights there. Do you want to control, do you want to own a, a scarce resource? Yes, you do. Yeah. So actually, uh, uh, people... was, <laughs> that reminds me of something I was listening to a few episodes uh, to prepare for this. And you mentioned the game Civilization. I just wanted to say that I'm a Civilization player fan as well. Yes. And I think there are a lot of business insights you can take away from from playing Civilization. My first was Civilization 2. I played a lot of Civ 2, and then um, I played a lot of Civ 5, like so much Civ 5, and then a little bit of Civ 6. Um, what, how did you get into that? Uh, well, I mean, I was a kid, right? And it's super fun. But I love, so I love that that aspect of you create systems there, you identify opportunities, you exploit them, and you go from there. Um, but it was also really telling for me where I have my limits, right? And where I'm not good, which is, like certain people, and I, I would guess you're one of these people, no matter how big your civilization gets, like you can still manage all that stuff going on and you <laughs> might find joy in it. And you can correct that if you want. But to me, once my civilization got to a certain point and I was like, oh crap, like I got to move this engineer all the way over here off of across eight turns. There's no way I could do that. We're, like, the, I we're would similar in that. Like I, I love the beginning part of the game to the point yeah. where I will, every time I sit down and play, I'll play like the first two hours and then I I save the game, but I never come back to it. I always just start a new one. Yeah. And that's and that and that has translated in terms of how I do business. <laughs> like it, I will I will shiny object like crazy. And I have to set up things if I know there's things I have to do that are repetitive and require my focus. Like I have to set actually where I have my calendar and it's like, okay, like once a month, which, you know, my meeting at the top of the hour is like an interim board call. So I can make sure I focus on this one company. Otherwise, like, like I will just be up in the clouds and not even really think about it just because of how I'm wired. And so like how I played civilization is actually how I play business, except with civilization, I couldn't automate things, but in business, I get to make the rules. So I automate the hell out of things and make sure it's just set up in a way that, okay, here's the system put together and I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to depend on my memory to make sure this keeps going and it'll squeak at me if it has problems and then we keep going. And that's how, that's, that's why I do it the way I do it. I love that. So just to return to kind of your your path, your journey, like I think like when I think about myself and a lot of my peers, we have a successful operating business that's thrown off, you know, maybe up to a couple million a year. Um, but like I think the default path here is just, oh, well, we're just gonna keep growing. Like we're just gonna keep growing units under management. Maybe we'll acquire another business in another city and add that. And we're just like I think the default path in a lot of people's minds when I talk to them at conferences and inter interview them on podcasts is like, what's next? And implicit in that is like, what's next for your business? And we do a lot of things, even like the EOS stuff, right? And we're going to get into EOS a little bit because it's really popular among property management companies. Um, EOS really encourages you like, what's your three year? What's your 10 year, right? Like, and imp sort of implicit in that, or at least it, it, maybe I'm off base here, but is like you as the... CEO are taking your company and your team on this journey and you're going to be there the whole time as a full-time operator. So how do we, like, is that wrong? And like, if it is, how do we break out of just this, I have a business, I run it for my lifetime mentality? Yeah. Why, why should we break out of it? I don't think there's anything. I, yeah. I mean, to answer your first question, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I think there's nothing wrong with choosing a W-2 job. I have a whole Twitter thread that I wrote this morning about like, look, like most people, W-2 jobs are better. Like you should just go, like you're going to be happier. So go do that. And like, like just because Twitter tells you you should own a business, like just stupid. It, it's mostly people trying to sell you stuff, including me. Like it, I'm, I'm selling stuff. Join scale Please buy my whole code course. <laughs> so <laughs> but like it, it, it comes back to this idea, like, you know, a W2 job is a perfectly fine lifestyle. Like, and I'm watching a YouTube video of a guy, he's, uh, he's a recovering alcoholic. Uh, he's, uh, he's writing a, he's riding a skateboard all the way across America and doing vlogs every day. That's right for him. Like, like it's crazy. It's crazy to me that people go on social media and they're like, this is the one way to live. 
because of this stylistic choice you want to make. And there are principles that are timeless. But then you have these things where it's like the stylistic choice. And who am I to tell you, like, my style is going to be, you know, and my dreams are what's right for you. It's just such a bunch of BS. Mm -hmm. Like, I just hate it. Yeah. And um, it took me years to get over that. But now I'm fine. Anyway. But like, so if you and most of my friends in my Vistage group, they run one business. They own it. They're the CEO of it. They control their own destiny. They're working in their business and they're perfectly happy and fine doing that. And that's totally fine. And I show up and I'm like the weird tweeterer who like, you know, does a whole co-business, right? And like, there's nothing wrong with my path either. And so I, you know, that's my rant about that. Like, I don't feel bad about it. If if that's what's right for you, like do that. Absolutely. Like, I'm not going to tell you to, to go do live my lifestyle. Like, that's just dumb. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting observation is that yeah, I think there's a a lot of the circles I run in, there's kind of a uh, a default toward Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, Hold Co, capital allocation. Like for whatever reason, that's sort of held up on a pedestal as what we should all be aspiring to. And I think you're doing a great job of pointing out that that's that's not it's not good or bad. It's not right or wrong. For some people, that's the right path. For other people, it isn't. And you can be happy doing that or not doing that. But to pursue that just because a bunch of other people think it's like the cool thing is probably a bad move. Yeah, it's never a good way. Yeah, think about what's going to make you happy. You know what's Warren, Warren's happy about? He's happy reading the newspaper all day and making a few bets a year and running the shtick that is Warren, right? Like that is a cultivate, like we should just be realistic about it. Like every public media personality is a cultivated personality. And he and Charlie have this all shucks like thing that they've done. It is, it is. You think that they are that intentional about how they run their business, but they're not that intentional about how they put out their public persona and how that is all very handcrafted and intentional. It totally is. Right. Um, and if you dig into like their personal lives, their personal lives are like super interesting or how they got started. Like, you know how they're like super anti-debt now? When they both got started, it was debt craziness. Like they <laughs> were borrowing money yet. all over the place, <laughs> leveraged 140%. Like it was like, so, so yeah, you got to be really careful about under taking that cultivated persona and then believing that's reality. Yeah. Right? And that's, that's the classic internet mistake that everyone makes is you only see the best 1% of everyone's life on social media. You don't hear about their family and their, you know, yeah. Skeletons in the closet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know if we, uh, <laughs> what, what more you want to hear from me on that? I feel very strongly about it. Cause it's just like, uh, like, and it's always like, yeah, it's like, maybe it's a middle-aged guy thing where it's just like, oh, like stop telling people what to do. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's none of your business. Like give them, give them the freedom and the love to be their best people and go from there. And maybe this is being teenager dad. I think there's some deep wisdom there. Um, unfortunately I think it's advice that you can hear it a hundred times, but until it just bounces off you until you're ready to hear it. It's like, what's that thing about like when the student is ready, the master appears. Um, it just, you know, until, and I almost think you need to have some level of success before you're ready for that message. Because to people who aren't there yet, it just sounds like you're saying nonsense. Like, why would anyone not want what you have? But like, I believe you when you're saying it, um, but there's a weird dynamic there. Um, so I'd like, uh, Sort of along a similar theme here, I wanted to get into a little bit about um, the value of your time, not your time specifically, but the value of one's time and how to think about spending your time. We talked a little bit about how you personally spend your time, but um, you've got an interesting way of thinking about um, selling your time, but not a lot of it, but at a price that scares away most people. And, um, you know, like I think historically, you know, getting back to what everyone says on the internet, you should never sell your time, right? You need to do a SaaS business where you separate your time from the value you're creating. Like that's a big theme. And, you know, even, even just any small business, right? You're supposed to be elevating, elevating, elevating. So you're not selling your time, but you do sell some of your time. And I actually sell some of my time. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you think through this. So my... <laughs> My son is, uh, we're talking about, you don't know what's going on in people's lives a lot. And you know, my son has chronic health issues. So my wife and I are like, so his tutor just arrived and he decided not to get out of the room. <laughs> I was like, get your ass down there and get to work. Yeah. Kid, kid so. stuff is, uh, you know, you never know when it's going to you know, rise up and interrupt your day. And that's just life as a parent. Yeah, no. It, well, it's also how I think about like, um, social media, right? It's like, it's much easier when you're just like, look, I'm going to be 
reasonably transparent with everybody. And am I going to show you my audited financial statement? No. But am I going to lie to you? No. And then like, is there any part of my life that I'm really living that I'm ashamed of? No. <laughs> like, it's just like, so like, I'll just tell you like, and people can either be part of the journey or not. So anyway, I'm fine with that, that being there. Look, I think um, back to selling time, it's something I've really struggled with. Um, you know, one of the things that happens when you put stuff out for free on social media and help other people is they think, well, okay, well, like this person wants to help me personally. They develop a personal relationship with you. So I get a ton of DMs where it's like, hey, give me free consulting or do this for me. And um, it was a real struggle because I don't know how to filter out who to help. And I could go into that and really help people and they'll just keep taking. So, you know, eventually I ended up with, okay, if you really want my time, if it's super important to you, you can pay for it. Here's the, here's where I price it. I price it at $2,000 an hour. That's in a lot of money for some people. It's totally worth it. And it happens every once in a while for most people, it's not worth it. And they'll be like, okay, well, someday it's there. Um, and you know, it, it has an added side effect, which is like, I want to work with people that are like intelligent, insightful, like really committed. And when you put a price tag like that on it, it only attracts those kind of people. Um, and it's also like how I priced my course. Like it's pretty darn expensive. And it's because I'm okay only selling 150 or 200 of them. Um, but to people that are like the type of people I want to spend time with. So yeah, that's, that's how I do it. I think there's an added benefit of being a practitioner of all this stuff is that it feeds into sharpening the saw, like having those conversations, doing podcasts. Um, you're not paying me, obviously <laughs> this, we're friends. Um, but like all of that has the benefit of sharpening the saw where like, uh, like, 80% of my tweets are actually things that are just happening in the meeting that I'm in right there. And I'm like, oh, this would be a good tweet. And I'm going to tweet exactly what this particular issue is. So the consulting also helps with that. In the grand scheme of things of economics, should I probably not do it at all? Is it probably just a distraction? Yeah, but I don't know. Yeah, Kind of fun. No, I get it. And um, I've taken a similar approach. I've played around with my hourly rate. I mean, you can book an hour with me on my website. I'm not charging 2000 an hour, but I'm charging. I think I have it set at 800 right now. And I do get, you know, I'll, I'll get one of those every other week. Someone will book and I'm happy to do it. It's fun for me. Um, and then I do some a very limited amount of like coaching with, you know, over three month engagements. And like I, the way sort of to circle back to what we were talking about at the beginning, I do it because it's fun for me. If it wasn't fun for me, I wouldn't do it. And I end up learning a lot. And I end up in the course of helping folks, I surface actually great content because you pick up on themes. People are asking the same stuff over and over and you're like, okay, there's obviously an interest here. And let me put together a Twitter thread or a blog post or a resource that now other people can access for free because there's something to this. There's something here that people want. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about operations. I, I really respect your operational uh, mindset and the way you think about which is funny because you're a big time like visionary guy, 80,000 foot view, but you actually have some really great operational insights. Um, you have a great uh, link on your website, uh, girdly.com slash playbook. And it talks about the framework that you recommend for basically a, any small business. And I remember I first, uh, I've been following you on Twitter for quite a while. I first saw this, it must've been two to three years ago. And I pulled it up and I looked at it and I was like, I was like, okay, we're doing that already that's super expensive. That's way too expensive. This is crazy expensive. I'm never going to do this. <laughs> and then slowly over the course of the next two to three years, we ended up pretty much doing it verbatim. Like, <laughs> so like all the stuff that I was like, no, we're not going to do that. This is stupid. I'll figure it out myself. Like it, we ended up just doing all of it. And I'm guessing you went through a similar journey, which is why you now have this thing you put together and this is how you recommend folks do it. So like Culture Index is on there. EOS is on there. Um, there's a, uh, a marketing methodology that's on there. And um, the stuff works. Like it just works. And I, of course, had to learn all that the hard way by messing around with other stupid stuff that didn't end up working. Um, and so... Is this like, I'm assuming you recommend this playbook to all the companies in your holding company. Do you mandate it? Do you highly recommend, like, how does that play out? EOS is on there, of course. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, well, sometimes you got to just like learn the stove is hot. By <laughs> yeah, exactly. Putting your hand on the stove, that was exactly right? my experience. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, yeah. And it's, it's one of those things also where it's like on Twitter, I'm just like, okay, well, like if people want to do stuff a certain way, like I'm, I've been wrong enough to have humility in terms of being like, no, no, like you got to do it my way. <laughs> just like, no, because I've been wrong so many times. It only takes a few advising of small businesses and telling them to do something stupid and then they do something different and it works and you're like, oh, okay. Like there's, I need to, I need to temper how I recommend on stuff. Um, so in terms of how that playbook works with, with my companies, there's some elements of it that are mandated. Uh, and then there are some elements of it. It's like, okay, we'll figure out what you want. So like, um, we have Q12 and there's one of the ones I recommend for employee engagement. Um, there are actually, I think four different versions of employee engagement measurement and employee satisfaction management measurement that are used inside of my portfolio of companies. Um, one is like homegrown, then there's like culture amp. And then I, I forgot the other one that people are using. Um, I see those numbers, but they're, they're not universal. Um, so that's, there's those elements of it are where the CEOs get to decide if they want to use that or not. Some people use Monday, some people use, um, what's that other one that, um, is, is a task tracking, like the task tracking one. So those are all kind of choices, choices. Yeah. Uh, whatever sauna, I guess, um, choices that they get to make. There are ones that are mandated where it's like, you know, if they, and it's somewhat implicitly because I interface with those things. So EOS is one where they're like, okay, where's our plan for next year? And I'm like, okay, where's your one page strategic plan, the VTO, like show it to me, like, or what's our, what's, you know, what's this, or what, what do you think about this candidate, Michael? Okay. Well, show me what their predictive index or culture index results are. Show me what their um, results are on the gentleman or aptitude, like, like I test that we use. So those are pretty much there, but they're kind of implicitly mandated. And the contract I have with all the companies is, look, I'm gonna ask everybody to use this. Ultimately, if you decide it's what's best for the businesses to go a different direction on them and use something different, like go ahead, I trust you because you're the CEO and I'm not the CEO and your job is to execute the mission. And my job is to make sure you have the best chance of doing that. And if you wanna do something different, that's great, but otherwise use, I recommend you use this one. And so that's the implicit, you know, contract there that I have with them. And it's a little complex, but it reflects what's really important when you have a CEO, which is you got to let the CEO CEO. And I try to minimize the number of times where I'm like, I'm the owner. This is the way we're going to do it. Like that maybe happens once or twice a year, like where we'll disagree. And I'm like, I'm sorry, it's just going to be this way. Um, and I try to minimize that because in the end, like you want an entrepreneurial CEO, cause I'm not in there doing stuff every day. They should know more about the business than I should, um, just because of the way we have stuff structured. Yeah. It's fascinating to me how universally applicable a lot of the items in that playbook are. Um, it's like one small business is just like another, even though they can be doing radically different things. One's products, one services, one SaaS, one's fireworks, right? Um, the EOS method has really taken off within the property management world. Um, I think, I mean, we run on it and have for years, we self Im implemented it and then ended up bringing in a, a professional implementer. Um, the visionary integrator dynamic, I think really resonates with property management company owners. Um, classically, right? Everyone wants to be the visionary and <laughs> struggles to find the integrators. And um, I feel like every time I post about anything having to do with visionary integrator and how I found my COO and everyone's just, it gets a lot of engagement because there's, I think that's a real struggle for folks. The, the CEOs, um, in your companies, are they, do you, are they like the visionary of that company or is it like you're the visionary and then they're the integrator who's running that company or does that not really apply? Um, I'm not the visionary. So with the companies, uh, we want the vision, the culture and all that stuff to be owned by the CEOs. So they have an entrepreneurial, you know, mindset in terms of approaching it. Um, so yeah, they, they will fill the visionary and integrator roles themselves. And I don't do that. Um, it would be impossible for me to be doing the visionary role. Cause like, I'm not in there talking to their customers. I'm not in there seeing the day to day. Like I'm not in there getting the pulse of their culture. Like I can't and shouldn't be doing that as a board member. I want to, uh, someone on Twitter got one more Twitter, I guess, point, because I always put a call out on Twitter. What should I ask, you know, Michael Girdley or Nick Huber? Um, someone said I should ask you about the chief of staff role. And this is relevant for me. Um, I've never hired a chief of staff. I actually don't even have like an executive assistant or anything. So the the best way I, I, I heard someone articulate this, and it might have been you, um, 
because a lot of people are like, all right, what is chief of staff? Everyone's talking about this. The way I heard it described is it's a it's a direct report to the CEO, but instead of being a manager, they are an individual contributor. So they're like uh uh there's someone who's gonna plow ahead and clear roadblocks for the CEO. They're they they do not have direct reports, they actually are just like working on the CEO's specific projects. Is that how you think of it? Uh, I think that's exactly right. Right. And I think, so let's say you're a CEO um, and I wrote a thread about this. There's like four types of, four types of tasks in front of you. Like there's, um, and responsibilities. There's like task number one, which is like, it's below the line. You just shouldn't even be doing it. Right. Like just don't just say no to that type of stuff. Right. So that's easy. Then I think there's, for most CEOs, there's EA type stuff, which is like coordination, making sure like schedules are aligned, meeting planning, making sure you're, your expense reports get put in correctly, like all of that kind of stuff. Like people need an EA for that. I don't need an EA because like my philosophy is if my schedule looks like that, that it's gotten so, so big that I don't have time to manage my schedule, then I'm really screwing up my schedule because that means I don't have enough creative time in my life. So I don't have an EA. I've never had one and I don't really want one because like I could book my own flights. Like it's <laughs> kind of fun actually. Um, <laughs> Then there's this other bucket of stuff. And so let's go to number three, which is like you're a CEO or a high performer and there's stuff that like is high impact and only you can do, right? And like that stuff where it's like one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with CEOs, like we have a, we're meeting with a new financing source. Like I got to go to that stuff. Nobody can do that stuff for me. That stuff needs to stay on my plate because it's that high impact um, and, and only I can do it. Then there's the other step of it, which is in all the initiatives that you have as a high performer, there's high impact, but somebody else could do it. Right. And so, for example, let's say you need to hire a new CEO for a hold co there's 90% of that process that somebody else could run, like the screening of candidates, the putting together the job description, the um, the checking daily on how you're advertising it, like tweaking that advertisement. Um, all of that like could be done by somebody else, but they need to have that kind of problem solving ability to be able to get through those, right? Um, or you're getting ready to do an acquisition and you need somebody to come in and do a financial, basic financial model of that, right? And then help you work with the portfolio company. By the way, these are real projects my chief of staff does. And what that does is it allows you as the CEO or the high performer to hand that stuff off to somebody else um, to where you can magnify the time that you spend on high impact must do type stuff. And so that's really where the chief of staff fits in is like, they're your force multiplier by taking that like quadrant of things on your plate and owning those things. So you can spend more time on the stuff that only you can do. Yeah, that uh, that's well articulated. And I think, I mean, reflecting on my own growth, you know, over the last 10 years of starting and running uh, the management company here, I think one of the biggest breakthroughs for me was getting more and more comfortable with handing stuff off, delegating. Um, I think a huge limiting belief I had early on, and I'm still breaking through this continuously, is getting comfortable with the idea that other people can do stuff that I think only I can do. Um, a lot of the stuff that you articulated that you've handed off to a chief of staff, even I was like, ooh, mm, I don't know if I like, mm, that sounds really important. Like writing the job description for hiring a CEO. Like, um, so it's like, the, and for me, the way I've broken continuously broken through this over and over and over, and I still got a long way to go, is a couple things. One, I observe it in action by being around other people who are ahead of me, like you, and hearing them talk about, oh, yeah, no, dude, I just have my assistant do that. Like, what are you doing? Why are you still messing with that? Like, almost like in a joking around shaming way. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess I guess that's possible. Like, <laughs> this guy was like doing it for three years. And um, so... It's like a so, so. Can I interrupt? Yeah, you? go ahead. So here's 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 what I think is super important. Like there is this distinction between abdicating a responsibility and like staying appropriately involved in that. So let's take the job description thing. Super important to get right. Super important to get right. Like in that, and if you have a chief of staff, for example, the chief of staff would spend an hour or let's say two hours doing what you would do, which is go research all the different job descriptions out there, come back with a good couple of examples, uh, write up a draft job description, revise it at least once, maybe twice, send it out for feedback, and then it gets published, right? 
So like where I would insert myself because I'm with you, like that job description has got to be super good. We got to make sure it's really good. But instead of doing step one and step two, which are pretty easily described for a smart person to do that, I'm going to show up probably at 50% completion before that first edit and then at 100% completion before it gets published. So what I've done is instead of that being a three hour project for me and taking up a lot of brain cycles and also the cost of energy to do that, I'm going to make it a 10 minute project for me. So that's why I say it's a force multiplier. Chief of staff doesn't let you abdicate responsibility for stuff. You still have to maintain your quality and get involved. It just lets you do it much more efficiently than if you were doing it on your own, right? And so anyway, I, I don't know if you just, we just turned a discussion into a teaching moment, but like I heard you talking, I was like, oh, no, 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 I love this. you should think about it. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it, I think what you're describing is exactly what I need to hear, which probably means a lot of people in my audience need to hear this too. And for me, like I pretty, I pretty quickly got comfortable delegating um, activities that I hated. You know, low value, repetitive, right? Like the classic one in property management is like showing properties, like the 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 leasing, showing up at a property and walking someone around a unit. Um, I was totally fine with <laughs> taking that off my plate. And I think what you're highlighting is that some activities you delegate once and forever and you don't like i don't check in on the leasing agents i don't want a 50 percent you know update from them like halfway through the showing or anything right so it was a new skill and a new muscle for me to to have the distinction between oh this is something i can just completely get rid of and never think about again to no this is something that's pretty important but that doesn't mean i need to do everything um i can i can still delegate but i need to be involved minimally right so I love that. And so for me, it was like hearing other people talk about doing this. And then the second part of it was that I needed to be around higher um, skilled people, right? Like if you've never worked with someone incredible, uh, you may not realize how skilled other people can be. I don't know. Maybe that's a weird thing to say, but like I didn't I didn't have a lot of business experience before I started my company. And so um, it wasn't clear to me the range of skills and capabilities that existed within the people that I could hire, right? And some of that was budget, right? When you're starting, you can only afford very uh, limited salaries and entry-level folks. And then when you get to the point where you are and where I'm starting to be, you can pull in much higher caliber people. And then you're like, oh yeah, there are super, super smart people, highly capable people that are willing to come work for me. And that means I can, there's this whole category of things that I thought I had to do that I actually don't. And then, and then the real mind F is when you start hiring people that can do things or own things that are an order of magnitude better than you can. Like that's like, literally there are companies in my portfolio being run by CEOs and they could do the job much better than I can, like a hundred percent. Um, like my, my chief of staff can do stuff better than I can. She manages me a lot. It's great. Like our one-on-ones, I'm, I'm like three one-on-ones in, I was like, wait, she's managing me. She's like, okay, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. What do you think about this? Like, you, like I was like, I'm getting managed. Um, and it's like, you know, what taught me that lesson is when I was a CEO, we hired a guy who came in and he was just like a magical salesperson. Like he would just go out and he'd be like, yeah, okay, well, I'll go take care of that. We'll be like, okay, we need this deal. And he's like, yeah, I'll go take care of that. And then he'll come back the next day and he's like, here's the signed contract. I'm like, how did you do that? <laughs> uh, he's like, oh, I would just go sit and talk to them about their grandkids. And then at the end, I would ask them to sign the contract. The problem was uh, we had to fire him eventually because he was be 90% truthful with these people, but he would kind of like, you know, get a little off on the last 10%, you know? So the magic that let him be so successful was also the magic that got him into trouble. But like it opened my mind to like, oh, like people have these superpowers and your job as a boss is to identify them and then create an environment where they can thrive and focus on those. And like, that is such, that was such a magical moment for me. And, you know, that's how I spend my days now. That's my whole job is like, and I don't mean to diminish people and, and turn them into things, but like, you know, your job as a business leader eventually becomes just looking at the board of chess pieces and like understanding the queen can do this and the bishop can do this. And how do I make sure the bishop does what the bishop is supposed to do? And let's let the bishop be the best bishop they can be. Like, that's like, that's what I do all day. Like that's the core of it. And maybe that's why I also, I like chess and I'm also bad at chess. I'm bad at chess because I have a bad memory. Like I can't, chess is just a memorization game. Those guys, it's not about computation. It's about those guys memorizing stuff and uh, they all have crazy memories, um, which makes it kind of a dumb game, but also a good game. Yeah. Like all the historical games, like I've seen videos where they're like, 
two moves in, they're like, oh yeah, this was the 1957, you know, third game. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> all right, we, we've got just a couple minutes left. I wanted to ask you about ScalePath. Uh, this is one of your more recently launched uh, businesses. It's a paid community for folks who are looking to grow their companies. Um, how's that going? What was it like sort of ideating that there? And um, just for anyone who might think it's a, a great thing, uh, share a little bit about what it is. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it is for um, business owners that want to um, scale their business. And we went out and talked to going on 50 plus small business owners. And these were people kind of in the 500K to 5 million range. Um, and they all aspirationally wanted to scale themselves and their business, but they were kind of stuck. That's the phase where you're really stuck in the business rather than being able to work on it. You potentially don't have enough capital to, to hire right people. You don't even maybe know how to do it. Um, and so we have seen this model where peer groups have been very successful for people like me. It's been transformative, but there was a period where I had to get from, get to be ready to go into a Vistage or a YPO or an EO. Um, and like, we wanted to solve for that kind of transition period where you go from individual contributor to scalable business owner and like EO or Vistage, they expect you to know how to hire people when you show up. Like, but there's no class that teaches you how to do that. So we decided to build something specifically for those people um, at, a, at a price point they can afford. It's 200 bucks a month. Um, it's all online um, that we may be doing more in-person stuff. And then it has a, an educational component where it's like, oh, you wanna know how to hire, you wanna know how to budget? Like, we're gonna put it on a PDF for you. And like, you could just download it and use it because they didn't want to go to educational stuff, these people. They wanted to go to, they just wanted answers. Like, just tell me how to do it. That's what they want. Cause they gotta get back to their business. They can't go, they don't have the time to go spend a whole day in Vistage or YPO. Like they just can't. So yeah, we built it, um, announced it on Twitter as an MVP. Um, we've gotten close to hundred paying members already and we're building the plane as we're flying it. My associate Sam is the CEO. Uh, so he has, gra he has graduated off the payroll and uh, it's very exciting to see him. And he's so stoked with it. Like um, he's just, the best part about it for me is he's just having so much fun building the business. Like he's just tap dancing to work like every day and uh, it's gonna go. That's a great success story, yeah. Um, beautiful. I love the branding for it too. Um, I was checking out the, the website and you've got some great like testimonials and it's great stuff. Well, um, I know we've got a hard stop. Thank you for coming on, Michael. This has been really fun. I appreciate your time today. And for folks who want to follow along with you and your journey and what you're up to, wh where's the best place to do that? Uh, Twitter's great. Um, I'm at Girdley on Twitter, G-I-R-D-L-E-Y, or um, check out my website, girdley.com. It will be better soon. My media <laughs> team is fixing it and making it good. <laughs> Speaking All right, of sounds managing good. Me. <laughs> All right, man. I appreciate you. All right. Thanks, Michael.